hear that perspective. So thank you very much. Please uh, arrive at the stage. Thank you. It is, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and a, and a real privilege to have been asked to be part of this uh, gathering this afternoon uh, with uh, my esteemed colleagues here on the front row and, uh, and I hope that I can move in a multi-faith world. I want to talk a little bit to start about the reality of Islamophobia, at least as um, I see it playing out in America, I can't speak to the Canadian context, but certainly uh, Islamophobia, unfortunately, is alive and well in America. And it plays out in a number of troubling, but um, in some ways also interesting ways. And the first way is very troubling, it's very troubling to me. And that is, I think it's fair to say that Islamophobia is probably the only socially acceptable form of discrimination currently in America. Now, there are other forms of discrimination. Racism is still very much a part of the fabric of American life, unfortunately. But if you say disparaging, denigrating comments about African Americans in a public setting or in the media, um, there will be backlash. You will get in trouble. Uh, one well-known disc jockey uh, was taken off the air because of a very disparaging comment about African-American women. If you say denigrating and disparaging comments about, uh, about women, um, you, will, you will get in trouble. There, are, there will be backlash against that. But, Today in America, I think it's fair to say that you can say the most damaging, denigrating, degrading thing about Islam and Muslims in public in America, and few people will even bat an eyelash. It is not just that there is Islamophobia in America, but it is that Islamophobia is socially acceptable. Because it is socially acceptable, this leads to the next point in terms of, of one of the very interesting ways to think about Islamophobia. Because it is socially acceptable, politicians have figured this out, that it is socially acceptable to be Islamophobic, and therefore, Islamophobia has become a political strategy. We saw this in 2008 when President Obama was running for president, and we see it now in 2012 as he is running for re-election. This constant drumbeat from President Obama's opponents trying to convince us that while all the evidence suggests that he is a Christian and has been a Christian for a long time, that he is somehow some secret Muslim. Because if he's a Muslim, the idea is that then he's not legitimate as a president. Now, last time I read the U.S. Constitution, it said that there was no uh, t religious test for public office, so it shouldn't matter whether he's Muslim or not. Um, but that's just what the Constitution says. In reality, there are religious tests for public office in America. Um, you pretty much have to be a Christian to run for president to, to become elected. So. Because Islamophobia is, 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 is so deeply ingrained now in American society, because it is socially acceptable, it has become a political strategy. If President Obama's opponents can, can convince enough voters that he, in fact, is a Muslim, then that will delegitimize him as a valid presidential candidate. And so this has become a new political strategy. Now, another way that Islamophobia rears its ugly head in America is through a number of fairly high-profile um, events, uh, uh, situations that have gone on over the last few years about the building of mosques and Islamic centers in various American cities. The most well-known was uh, the one in New York City, the, the Park 51 um, Islamic Center, a community center that was to be built um, near Ground Zero in, in Manhattan. 
But I found very interesting another one that hasn't gotten quite as much attention, and this is one in the town of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The Islamic community in Murfreesboro wanted to build uh, a fairly large and extensive Islamic center. Uh, there are many people opposing the building of this Islamic center. But what I find most interesting about the Murfreesboro situation is one of the strategies being used by the opponents of this Islamic center to, uh, to try to undermine it and, and resist the, it, its building. The strategy is that um, one of the state, sent, uh, I think it was a state senator, Tennessee, in this area, argued that, well, the people who were uh, uh, advocating for the building of this Islamic center were saying, well, there's nothing we can do. We can't stop. It's perfectly legal. We can't stop Muslims from building this. They, they purchased the ground legally. They can build an Islamic center if they want. And after all, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees uh, the free exercise of religion. So Muslims have the same free exercise rights to their religion as anybody else. So we can't stop them from building this Islamic center. So a state senator and some other people came along and said uh, their strategy for opposing the Islamic center was to simply say, but Islam is not a religion. It's a political ideology. And because it's not a religion, Muslims don't have, are not protected under the First Amendment free exercise rights. Now, this is highly problematic, but one of the thing, what I find so interesting and ironic about this attempt to deny Islam having the status of religion in order to uh, resist the building of an Islamic center is that the discourse about Islam not being a religion occurs within certain Islamic contexts too. I work very closely, have for the last two and a half years, with an organization in suburban Detroit called the Islamic Organization of North America. And they actually publish a little pamphlet titled, Islam is not a religion. So if Islamophobic opponents of Islam say that Islam is not a religion, but some Muslims also say that Islam is not a religion, then that tells me as a scholar of religion that the concept religion itself is a very, very problematic one. And it is. Now in the time that I have this afternoon, I won't be able to share with you all of the, the details of those problems, but I will point out a few of them as we go forward. What I want to focus my talk on is the irony is of Islamophobia. And the irony of Islamophobia is simply this. By constructing Islam and Muslims as enemies to be resisted, American public discourse is, is, discourse is at the same time cutting itself off from intellectual and spiritual resources that could positively address some of America's most significant problems. As we in America, those who do in America, construct Islam and Muslims as the enemy, <coughs> as the one to be feared, the one to be rejected, we are at the same time, I think, rejecting important intellectual and spiritual resources that America needs <coughs> and that the Muslim community can provide. So let me talk about this in more detail. What are those resources? and how could they address problems facing America here in 2012. I want to focus my comments specifically on issues of economics. Because American society has reached a level of very high, or reached a position now of very high levels of economic injustice. I don't know quite how it is here in Canada, but in America, there is a high level of economic injustice. And I think this, beacon, this can be established by looking at a few facts. Uh, and this number has just recently come out. Currently, 23.1% of American children live in families with incomes below the federal poverty rate. Almost one quarter 
of American children are now living in poverty. America over the last 30 years has been characterized by, a rapidly, by rapidly growing levels of income inequality and growing wealth disparity. And you can see that um, graphically here uh, in, this, in this graph. You see on the left side there, between 1946 and 1976, um, gains in income uh, were, were shared uh, among those in the, the bottom 90% of, of wage earners and those in the top 1%, with the top 1% actually gaining a little, uh, substantially less than those in the bottom 90%. But then everything changed in the 1970s. And from 1976 until the present, um, the graph on the right, you can see what has happened. Those in the bottom 90% of wage earning classes in America have seen their incomes barely rise when adjusted for inflation. Virtually all of the income gains over that 30 year span have gone to those in the top 1%. So there is this growing, burgeoning disparity of wealth and concentration of wealth in the hands of a very small number of people. And the middle class is rapidly disappearing. Moreover, America happens to be the only advanced industrialized nation lacking some form of guaranteed universal health care for all of its citizens. And the public education system in America is very much in crisis. Now, against these facts, we also have a couple of others. Corporations are now currently making record profits in America, record profits. While 23% of American children are living in poverty, Corporations are making record profits. And I just heard a statistic the other day, something over two, uh, American corporations currently have more than two trillion, that's trillion with a T, two trillion dollars just sitting in cash on their balance sheets. Corporations are getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier as the middle class disappears and more and more people are slipping into poverty. Moreover, record amounts of money are now being spent on political campaigns. It's estimated that at least $2 billion, perhaps more, $2 billion, will be spent on the 2012 presidential election. Most of that just on advertising, $2 billion. Uh, this courtesy of the 2010 Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, which has allowed wealthy individuals and corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money um, in support of a, of a candidate. Now, we need to think a little bit about the causes of this economic crisis. What's going on in America and in other parts of the West? Um, the economic situation in America has become a lot worse since the financial crisis of 2008, which we are still struggling with and trying to get out of. And it's really no secret as to what caused the financial crisis of 2008. This isn't something that just happened. It happened for a specific set of reasons. And those reasons revolve very much around greed and legal, but still unethical, business practices. Wall Street investment banks, starting in, I don't know, the late 1980s or so, in the 1990s, uh, began to uh, create all kinds of exotic financial instruments and investments credit default swaps and securitized mortgages where they would take mortgages that they had given to people to buy homes and they would chop them up and package them and sell them off to investors all around the world. Um, and all of these, these exotic investments 
their 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 main purpose was simply to create more and more wealth they didn't return anything of value to the economy they just created more wealth upon wealth upon wealth upon wealth and these banks and those who worked for them became wealthier and wealthier and wealthier um, by creating these exotic investment vehicles that were based around mortgages as the world uh, wanted more and more of these investments that were based on mortgages the banks needed more and more mortgages so then they started creating more and more mortgages getting more people into mortgages that they couldn't afford um, these are some of the unethical practices and then when the housing market collapsed all these people were left holding the bag um, in foreclosure losing their homes and all the things that we see going on today so the, the causes of the financial collapse are, are, no, are no mystery and, and people who know more about this than I have read, written a number of books about it um, it was greed essentially that brought the American financial system down and the world economy to its knees as we talk about this and debate about it and about the debate about what to do people uh, get into these debates about well uh, you know maybe we need different kinds of regulation uh, some say uh, we have too many regulations we should we should have fewer regulations others say we should have more regulations some people say we should raise taxes other people say we should we should lower taxes but what's not being talked about in these conversations is the true I think underlying cause of all of this economic disruption and it's really I think a spiritual issue not a material one it's a society that has lost connection to deep spiritual resources that would allow it to reframe its economic life in a much larger context to ask the questions, is it really the purpose of life to simply accumulate as much wealth as you can? Why is that the purpose of life? Are there deeper purposes? Are there higher callings? We're not having these discussions in America. Why is economic value the only value that matters? The world's more from the perspective of Tawheed than from the sacred secular dichotomy. And as a result, even though I'm a Christian, I do answer the question, was Jesus a Muslim with a yes? In a very profound sense, Jesus was more like a Muslim than a modern, westernized Christian. Now, when we engage in, re in, in resistance to injustice, that resistance will itself be resisted by those who benefit from the unjust status quo. Uh, but Farid Isak, a South African uh, scholar of Islam, in his book on being a Muslim, reminds us that we need to appreciate that if we choose solidarity with the poor and the marginalized, then our option has a political character insofar as it means on a very fundamental worldview, foundational worldview, um, that, is, that is dualistic. It is a dichotomy. We talk about the sacred and the secular. And we make a sharp distinction between a sacred world, which is the world of religion and spirituality and God and prayer, and the secular realm, which is the realm of politics and economics and, and education and other social affairs. And we try to keep these two completely separate from one another. And this, this is where we get the concept of separation of religion and politics, or separation of church and state. And when we make this separation, then when we're dealing with, with, with issues in the material realm, the secular realm of economics and politics, we can't bring spiritual resources to that. Because spiritual resources, that's religion. That's the secular, that's the sacred realm. And we, we make this distinction and we keep those two realms separate, or at least we attempt to. This is where the word religion becomes highly problematic because a religion, as it becomes defined in the West, is something that is primarily a spiritual tradition, a spiritual practice, a set of beliefs and practices about a person's relationship to God. But religion, people like to say, has no, nothing to say to our material existence, to the realm of economics and politics. 
This is one of the places where I find insights from Islamic thinking so helpful. Because in my understanding, if I understand correctly, one of the basic fundamental concepts in the Islamic worldview is Tawheed, unity. Now, religion textbooks will tell you uh, that Tawheed refers to the unity of God, the oneness of God, and certainly that's true, but I don't think that's the full extent of the word. As I have it here on the slide, the unity of God, I think, implies the unity of humanity living in submission to that one God, which is where we get the idea of the Ummah, the worldwide Islamic community. But I think, think it also implies the unity and integrity of lived experience, such that a strict, sacred, secular dualism simply doesn't work within an Islamic conceptual frame. So I see Tawheed as being a, 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 a fundamentally different option from the sacred, secular worldview. And I think if we thought in the West more from the perspective of Tawheed and less from the sacred-secular dichotomy, um, I think we would be a lot better off. These ideas of unity, uh, I think, find expression in the writings of some Islamic scholars who have uh, written about um, economic topics. Let me just share a couple of quotes with you. Mustafa Mahmoud, uh, in an article titled Islam versus Marxism and Capitalism, makes what I find to be a really striking statement. He says, wealth is not sought for itself in Islam, but is sought as a means to piety and a way to upright, merciful, and loving action. This marks it as very different from the meaning of wealth in materialist capitalist economy and materialist socialist economy. It's that first sentence that really surprised me when I first read it. Wealth is not fought, sought for itself in Islam, but is sought as a means to piety and a way to upright, merciful, and loving action. I often like to think about um, you know, going to an economics classroom at, say, Harvard Business School or someplace like that, and standing up in that economics classroom and saying, wealth is a means to piety. I'm sure I would be left right out of the classroom. No. Wealth is not a means. Wealth is an end in itself, the accumulation of wealth. Capitalism, the ism means it's an ideology, the ideology of the accumulation of capital. Wealth is, is, is to be sought for itself. I lost the screen up, up here. Okay. Uh, wealth is to be sought for itself. Uh, it's not a means to something greater than itself unless it's a means to power. But it certainly is not a means to piety. For a means to piety, if we say it's a means to piety, then it, it, we're, 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 we're going against that sacred secular dichotomy and we're bringing a spiritual idea into the material realm and that's the thing that we try not to do. But I think the thing that we need to do and that we can learn from um, Islamic scholars who do this. Um, M. Umar Chapra in an article called The Islamic Welfare State writes, it is the duty of the Islamic State to ensure a respectable standard of living for every individual who is unable to take care of his own needs and hence requires assistance. It is the duty of the Islamic State to ensure a respectable standard of living for every individual. That's not the ethic that runs the American economic system. Not by a long shot. But it's an ethic that we need to think about. Or back to Mustafa Mahmoud. Um, and when Islam establishes a cot, legalized state interference and set up the first institution of social security, Islam makes interference a duty so that wealth will not remain among the rich as a monopoly of one class to the exclusion of the rest of the citizens. I think this is really important, and I think this can all be boiled down to two little dictums here. Materialist economics, as we practice it in the West, promotes greed, which leads to injustice. Islamic economic thinking, from my reading, seems to promote justice as the primary value. It's when I discovered this that it sent me back thinking about my own tradition as a Christian and to think about Jesus. And this is what led me to pose the question, was, as a Christian, to pose the question, was Jesus a Muslim? And I posed it and ended up writing a book about it. Was Jesus a Muslim? Um, 
Because as I look at Jesus through the pages of the Bible, what I find is someone whose life stood against the injustices of the Roman imperial system in which he lived. Jesus wasn't just going around talking to people about their spiritual interests, but for Jesus, proclaiming the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, meant that God was sovereign over everything. And if God is sovereign over everything, then that has implications for our material life as well as our spiritual life. Structures of injustice. Another colleague of mine and a friend, Dr. Afzal, uh, Ahmed Afzal, has written this booklet entitled Jihad Without Violence, in which he tries to recover jihad as a central concept for Muslims, despite the fact that it's one of the most fear-producing words among your average non-Muslim Western citizen. Uh, but he wants to reclaim jihad as a non-violent form of struggle, believing that non-violence can do more than violence, can accomplish more than violence. So Afsal writes, strictly speaking then, jihad cannot be conceived as one particular item in the list of all the obligations that human beings owe to their creator. Instead, jihad is the ever-present struggle that underlies and allows the realization of any and all such obligations. This makes jihad an indispensable part of being and becoming a Muslim, that is, a person who willingly submits to God's moral will. It seems to me that all who live in submission to God, or at least seek to live in submission to God, whatever religious label they might wear, Muslim, Christian, Jew, whatever it may be, that all of us are called at some level to be a threat to the unjust status quo. That doesn't mean to engage in violence, but to engage in nonviolent resistance to systems of, un of the unjust status quo. All of us are called to be a threat in that way. So I think it's really important for Americans and others as well to recognize that these Islamic resources, concepts like Tawheed and Jihad, particularly Jihad, regarding, regardless of how it gets portrayed in the media and in all its distortions, that these are fundamentally important concepts that we have so much in the West that we can learn um, in terms of our own lives and how we, how we organize our affairs. Um, so the dangers of Islamophobia are twofold. Clearly, one of the dangers is that Islamophobia unfairly denigrates the lives of Muslim people in a way that is deeply, deeply troubling and deeply immoral. And if that's all that Islamophobia did, that would be enough to resist it. But Islamophobia also cuts us off from intellectual and spiritual resources that we here in the West are in crucial need of, and at a time when we are in most need of them. So I hope that we can begin to bridge these divides and begin seeing the value that the Islamic tradition can bring to our lives as Americans, as Canadians, and anywhere else in the world. Thank you.